Okay, now we need a box office top ten. We have been speaking to members of our audience just before we uh, started the show. So we are going to get a couple of lines from you, Mark, uh, and then uh, our audience members will be shuffling down uh, to this microphone at the front. If you put your hand up, you know that it means you. Did you manage to get somebody who'd seen Animals United? Because of the top ten, that's the one that I haven't seen. No, we didn't find anyone who'd so seen no, Animals has United. Has no one seen Animals United? Or Fred the Movie. Oh, I've seen Fred the Movie. Yes, but we, <laughs> but we really, really don't want to go there ever, 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 ever again. And that's why you have a smaller microphone. Is it? Okay. It's for moments like that. So Due Date is our first film. There was uh, a gentleman who put his hand up who was prepared to admit that he'd seen Due Date. Do you want to come to the front, please, while Mark explains what he thinks of our number 10 movie? Well, the problem with Due Date is... You know, as I've said on a number of occasions, it, it is sort of Hangover 2, except the Hangover 2 is happening. And there are, there are individual moments in it when you think, well, OK, that's quite funny. And I, quite, I think Robert Downey Jr. himself is quite funny. But it is essentially planes, trains and automobiles, but not done as well. And it's funny that you watch it and you think, well, that's what passes for a half-decent comedy nowadays, because actually we haven't been surrounded by loads and loads of good comedies. People say, oh, well, I have got no sense of humour. It's not that. It's that we have... Well, I have, you know... But I've got some sense of humour. But the fact of the matter is, we have not had a great, you know, a, a great slew of brilliant comedies recently. We've had a lot of movies that make a film like Due Date make you go, oh, well, you know, hey, actually, it's not as bad as some of the stuff I've seen. Uh, yes, sir, what's your name? <clears throat> uh, my name's Greg. OK, Greg, why did you put your coat on to come up on stage? Just, you stood up and you put your coat on, it's boiling here. You know, I don't trust these guys, so I just... Uh, OK, no. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, what did you think of Due Date? Uh, underwhelming. Um, I went and saw it by myself. I was bored, so I would recommend you give it a miss. So. OK, that's exactly what we need. Thank you very much indeed. That's very good. <laughs> so unstoppable as well. Are you so unstoppable as well? Fine, stay there. That's very good. <laughs> Okay, uh, at number nine, unstoppable. <laughs> Man in a coat, you go first. Uh, yeah, a pretty good performance by Denzel Washington. Uh, it, uh, lots of excitement. Tony Scott, like a, it's like an acid trip. So, yeah, not bad. I, I recommend that. The, the, pro uh, the problem with unstoppable... You'd recommend... You'd recommend... What? Not the acid. No, no, no. <laughs> Thank you. Don't try that at home. No, 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 no. no. That's, acid is bad. Denzel's good. On balance, if you had to choose. I mean, the, the, the problem with Unstoppable is that it is... It's like Tony Scott having done the Taking a Pelham 123 thought. The problem with Taking a Pelham 123 is that the train isn't moving. I know. Let's make a film in which the train is moving. And, the, and it, it's, you know, it's nuts and bolts, tab A into slot B. And the problem with it, which I think is part of the reason why people like it, is that it is exactly what it says, except, as you keep pointing out, it's called Unstoppable. And however the film is going to end, the train is demonstrably not unstoppable. At the end of the film, the train will stop. I mean, you're not going to go and see a film about a runaway train. At the end of it, the train is still running away. <laughs> Wait a minute, I've paid for an ending. But it, it's, you know, it's, it's based, inspired by a true story based on real events. There really was a train that really did run away, really did run at about 47 miles an hour for a while, and then they caught up with it. And then it stopped. <laughs> and, and obviously the film is slightly more action-packed. than that. I mean, I think it's fine, I think it's perfect, but it is a Tony Scott movie about an unstoppable train. Fred's at eight, Animal United at seven, and that brings us to... <laughs> can I... Can I Burlesque, can I, no. no. No, genuinely, I, I, won't do the, I, won't do, I won't do the voice, all right? The thing with Fred, and this is important to say, there is an argument which is, OK, well, you don't like Fred the movie because you're not the target audience for Fred the movie, therefore you don't get Fred the movie. And as you all probably know, Fred is a huge internet sensation. He's this kid that started this channel, the Fred channel. I have looked at the Fred bits on the Fred channel, and believe me, they're a lot more entertaining than the movie for two reasons. Firstly, because when he's doing it on the channel, his voice is faster and he's, you know, it's moderately less annoying. But more importantly, they're in four-minute chunks. It's like anything else... It's like the Baron Knights. You know, you could probably listen to one Baron Knights single. Well, at a push, you know. But you wouldn't want to listen to a whole Baron Knights double album. That's well, a that's slightly you... outdated uh, Top 40 hit parade reference. <laughs> great, okay. mate. You could listen, great, mate. You could listen to Jasper Carrot's funky moped and possibly... That's really not moving it on very much. <laughs> <laughs> OK, who is a modern, popular comedy group? You <laughs> Says a voice from the audience. How well you've trained them. They don't, they don't think for themselves, they speak like their master. <laughs> anyway, Fred, right, done that. Uh, Animals United, no point, no, you no haven't one seen knows. it. No, no one's one got a clue. Uh, burlesque is at number six. Burlesque, it's gonna be burlesque. It's for 12 year olds, it isn't really dirty. 
out of your filthy okay, life. Enough. But this is in real life. It's clean, cause it's for okay, kids. Okay, it's enough. We have a real reviewer. What's your name, madam? My name is Yulan Suko and I'm from Hampstead School Film Club. Okay, excellent. So you sound as though you know what you're talking about. So what did you make of Burlesque? <laughs> um, I think Burlesque was fantastic because throughout the whole movie there was um, amazing music from both Cher and Christina Aguilera. And although it's not a comedy, there was a lot of smart remarks and a lot of wit, so it was actually quite funny as well. So I'd re- recommend it, definitely. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. That's very good. <laughs> Megamind. Megamind is at number five. You go first. Oh, oh, suddenly? Suddenly I get to go first? Okay, well, Megamind... I mean, the thing, uh, watching Megamind, I realised that I had underrated The Incredibles. The Incredibles is a better movie than anybody... than I had given it credit for, although everybody else seemed to really like it. Oh, everyone's ahhing now. <laughs> but it's not great. And... Hello, Joe. Hello, Mark. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Okay, disagree with Mark at your peril. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've got a, a reviewer from the audience. What's your name? Joe. We're talking to the microphone. Sorry. Joe. Okay, Joe who? Joe Mayo. All right, okay. Uh, all, right. all right, don't milk it. <laughs> Joe, hey. you remember at Christmas when I took you to the cinema and Daddy didn't because he was too busy? You remember that? <laughs> so, Megamind, what did you think? I really loved it. It was really funny. Okay, that's very good. <laughs> very good. Joe Mayo there. Uh, the Tourist is at number four. I mean, the, the, thing, the, the worst thing about The Tourist is the fact that... Did you all see the Golden Globe nominations? So the Golden Globe nominations in the musical and comedy category, the Golden Globes decided that three of the best musical or comedies of the year included The Tourist, uh, Burlesque, and Red, which is neither a musical nor a comedy, nor indeed one of the best of the year. But um, in the case of The Tourist, it's... You know, it's, if you've seen, uh, like, Wolfgang Pinson <laughs> Shattered, uh, it's basically that movie done with less wit and less intelligence, and it, there's a certain amount of fun to be had in it just because it is so completely goofy and stupid. And it's, it's one of those films, at the very beginning of it, they go, somebody, a significant character, has had £20 million worth of facial, facial surgery. Who could it be? Who could it be? Right? And then Angelina Jolie is told to get on a train and find somebody who physically resembles a character that's, you know, that's had £20 million worth of facial surgery. And she finds Johnny Depp. What do you think of the chances that after... Tw- uh, no, it, you know, so it's, it's completely stupid and dumb and it's terrible that the Golden Globes gave it. I mean, I, I, I laughed a couple of times. I thought it was perfectly, you know, fun. It's like eating popcorn. It's, you know, fine for about 20 minutes. Then you wonder why you're doing it. But it shouldn't have got a Golden Globe. <laughs> uh, what's your name, sir? Hi, I'm Sam. Uh, where are you from, Sam? Bolton. OK, what did you make of The Tourist? Uh, well, I, I was looking forward to it for a long time. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's like a fantasy team lineup. Um, from... Hang on, which, which bit is the fantasy team? Angeli- well, Angelina no, no, Jolie no. and Johnny Depp? No, from top to bottom, writers and director. Okay, I mean, so the director is... L- Liza Villa is, is, is so, 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 wonderful. Just direct- let him do the no, review. No, no. But it's no. <laughs> the director, Florian Henkel von Donnersmark, right? Okay. who everybody knows is the guy who directed you know, the, uh, the, the film that won the Oscar for Best Foreign Language Movie. So therefore, okay, we think we're going to get something that's you know, intelligent and thoughtful. Yeah, and I was excited about Christopher McQuarrie as well. Okay, um, yes, who got, you know, formed from usual suspects. And, and actually, I think that ended up being the problem. I mean, it was, like, it was so sort of immaculately put together, this lineup, that they saw um, this was this guy who years and years ago had done the film with the ultimate twist. And, um, and so we've got a twist and it's going to be big in this film. So who do we get? We get that guy from usual suspects. And, but we need some witty banter. So we get Julian Fellows to sort of. Uh, Plump it up a bit. And uh, for such a great lineup, it was just so bland and so unimaginative. But there's a little bit of guilty pleasure to be had. The main, the, okay, that's fine. The Let's main move on now to Harry. Paul Bettany in it. I mean, Paul Bettany is good fun in it. Round of applause. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, part one, HP7A. We'll have a couple of voices. Anyone who wants to come up and review this? Thank you, madam. Uh, after Mark, but come forward. Well, having, I've now seen it again since we last spoke about this, and the more I see it, the more I genuinely think that it's one of the, the very best of the Potters. I, I don't agree with the... With, 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 I know your reservation about it, that it doesn't have a proper ending. I do think it has a, a genuinely proper ending, a genuinely tragic ending, a second unfortunate event. And... The idea of taking the characters out of Hogwarts so that what happens is 
essentially the drama is about those three characters interacting. It's not all about the trappings of Hogwarts, which I like very much. Um, I, I think it really holds up. I think it really holds up as a character piece. Plus, it's, there is a sort of Bergman-esque air of doom about the whole thing, which I like enormously. And I, I'm impressed by the fact you can make a mainstream movie that's you know, a good, solid length and has done incredibly well at the box office that is essentially about the anticipation of catastrophe. Because that's what the film's about. It's about everyone, everything falling apart so that they can reunite in order to have the final battle. Madam, what's your name? Hi, I'm um, Lisa. Okay, Lisa, where are you from? I'm from Ireland originally, but I'm living in Essex. Okay, and what did you make of uh, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1? Well, for me, I think it was a perfect rendition of the book, and I'm a big fan of the books. I've watched them, or watched them, read them for quite some time. Um, but my boyfriend was with me watching it, and he hadn't read the books. And I think for him, he felt it to be a bit drawn out, but I absolutely loved it. I thought it was a perfect... Um, version of the books and exactly what I'd imagined. Okay, uh, we've got a couple of minutes before the news and sport coming up. Let's uh, tell you about the number two movie, which is The Chronicles of Narnia, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. If you put your hand up earlier, please come down, Mark, on that. Well, I think of all the, the, the Chronicles of Narnia ones, it, it, it is the weakest. I am reminded that when Chronicles of Narnia first came out, everyone said Lord of the Rings Light, and it really kind of is. On the other hand, it's not unlikable. I do think Will Poulter's a really good actor. Um, it's... Uh, on an allegorical level, it's funny because the narrative has none of the sort of simplicity of the first or indeed the second instalments, and it kind of ties itself up a little bit. The allegory doesn't quite work as well as it does in the first two films, but as we noted before, it's almost fatuous and pointless to point out that it's a religious allegory because it's the Lion, the Witch, and the way it's Narnia. It, the whole thing is a religious allegory. If you hadn't noticed that before now, what have you been doing? So do we not need to do the warning? May contain spiritual themes. May contain religious Stuff. Uh, Chronicles of Narnia number two. Yes, sir, what's your name? Um, I'm Ed, and I go to university in Brighton. Yes, Ed, welcome to the programme. What did you think of uh, Chronicles of Narnia, Voyage of the Dawn Treader? Um, I really enjoyed the last two, yeah. but this one definitely wasn't as good as the other two, and I think the Christian elements were so much more obvious in it. And even though I did like it, I went with my girlfriend, it was OK... I, wouldn't, I would go and see the other two again, but I wouldn't go and see this one again. But when you say the Christian elements are so much more... I mean, how much more could they be than they were in the first film? There's a lion, he's there, he sacrificed himself, he dies, then his body's gone, then he comes back, and it's like... <laughs> and then I know at the end there's in this, this thing... Yeah, he goes, um, it, I've got a name in, my, in the other world, learn to know me, I learn to know that name, and it's even more of it. I think in the other two... It is obvious, but it isn't kind of smack bang in your face. This is a Christian rhetoric. All right, Ed, thank you very much indeed. The number one movie is Tron Legacy. Ed, that's a round of applause. <laughs> Tron Legacy. We've got, we got two voices for that, and well, three because Mark goes first. Well, I was sitting there watching Tron Legacy in IMAX 3D, and I like IMAX and I don't like 3D. Yeah, and you I must do... tell us about that sometime. Yeah, and I do... <laughs> I like the idea of Tron because I have a sort of nostalgia. For, I mean, I remember when the first Tron came out, and you said that you, you, said that you didn't go and see it because you thought it sounded a bit childish, but it was that sort of nostalgia about playing video games and then watching a film that looked like a video game. And so I had a lot of goodwill towards it, plus I really like Jeff Bridges, as does everybody. And, uh, and I was sitting there watching it thinking, it, why is it that seeing this in, in the circumstance in which I'm seeing it, it's the great big screen in the centre of London, apparently being better projected than it will be anywhere else, you know, the thing's in focus, there's nobody kicking the back of my chair, why is it that all I can think of is that electronic Jeff Bridges' mouth doesn't work properly? <laughs> and uh, the reason is because the film is, in the end, oddly dull. Yes, sir. What's your name? Uh, Mikey from Edinburgh. Hello, Mikey. What did you make of this? Yeah, I mean, I went to see it again in a massive screen, and I've got to say, when it first comes up, the 3D, generally there was a bit of a when it came. So I think people, you know, I know, I know you're always flappy-handing about how much... Flappy-handing? This is like a, yeah. a verb. That's a new... It's a como verb, yeah. Um, about how bad 3D is. But actually, I think it worked in the context of this film. And, yeah, OK, the script was written on the back of a fag packet and chucked away. But it looked amazing, so... But crucially, what you said was... He said when the 3D first came up, and that's exactly the point. At the beginning, the logo came out, the Tron, everyone went, wow, look at that, it's right in my... Oh. Yeah, it's 3D, isn't it? And that's it. You know, it works for about a minute. Another voice. Yes, sir, who are you? Hi, Mike from Finchley, the spotter of uh, celebrities in North London cafes. Yes, Mike, what did you make of Tron? Uh, I was fortunate enough to see this film before I heard Mark's review. Uh, unfortunately, I agree with everything he said about it. Yes, sir. It's, uh, it's dull. The um, 
CGI Jeff Bridges just doesn't work. It's it not doesn't, convincing. Doesn't it? And it's really weird because it's not like they can't do that. I mean, it's not like you look at Gollum and you look at Dobby and you look at what you can do with him. I mean, even you look at Jar Jar Binks. I mean, for heaven's sake. I mean, you know, I don't, no, I know, I know. You know. 